Welcome everyone to a new episode of the Ambassador Series of our podcast, The Next Page, the podcast designed to advance the conversation on multilateralism. Today, I have the great pleasure to have in the studio with us the permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations here in Geneva, Ambassador and Professor Claudia Fuentes Julio. Uh, welcome to our podcast. You are here as ambassador and representative of your country since the summer of 2022. Prior to being a professional diplomat, you have been a professor at the Department of Peace Studies at Chapman University in the U.S., but also in the Catholic University, Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. And you've been a colleague also uh, seen from the Secretariat of the UN because you served with the UN from 2011 to 2019 in the areas of disarmament and, and development. So a really warm welcome to you, Ambassador. Thank you for taking the time. And please tell our audience a bit about yourself and how you came to diplomacy and to be the permanent representative of your country to the United Nations here in Geneva. Thank you so much, Francesco. I'm a real fan of the podcast, but also in particular of the work of the UN Geneva Library and Archive. Let me tell you a little bit about my journey. After finishing my bachelor's degree in journalism in Chile, at the time I wanted to be a war correspondent. This is why I studied journalism. But after that, I decided right away to do a master in international relations in London. And right after my master, I was accepted to an internship at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, right here in Geneva. That was exactly 24 years ago. So when I was offered this position, I said, well, this is really coming back, you know, to the starting point of my career. At the time, it was Mary Robinson, the High Commissioner of Human Rights. And for me, I was really impressed by her work. As you know, he's the former president of Ireland, and she did an excellent job in terms of heading the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And I was particularly impressed because she was also a woman, head of such an important organization. That was truly an inspiration, and it was also an really for the first time to see and to work closely, you know, uh, uh, with a woman in command of uh, such an important position. I also had the opportunity to work on the indigenous rights, uh, at that time, uh, it was uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People was being negotiated. So it was a very interesting time. It was also the start of the idea of the right to development. So we had several conversations about that as well. Also, uh, in my recall, I was the only intern uh, from Latin America at the time among many Europeans that also had an impact in terms of how I was viewing international politics of the time. But in the end, let me just say that I was very lucky to be exposed to the most important debate of human rights at the time. It was the end of the 90s, 99, 2000, which is kind of the golden era of human rights. So it had an impressive impact in my professional trajectory. After that, I went back to Chile. I worked for FLAXO, which is the Latin American Faculty for Social Sciences. It's one of the most important think tanks in the region with several headquarters across the region. I was based uh, in Santiago working on a project related to uh, human security. I liked many things about my job, but I had the opportunity to travel throughout Latin America and gain much better knowledge of the region as well. After that, I won a Fulbright scholarship to pursue a PhD in international politics at the University of Denver. At the time, I worked on a research that is pretty much connected to what I do today. It was comparing the human rights forest policy of Chile and Brazil. After that, and logically, I ended up working in Brazil for four years in Rio de Janeiro, actually a wonderful time of my life. I learned so much about Brazilian politics, and I was also about how to look at international relations also from a Brazilian perspective as well. So four years there. During all that time, I was very connected to Chilean politics as well. I was teaching at the Diplomatic Academy in Chile, and I was also working with different international organizations, UNDP, UNESCO, the Organization of American States, on many, many issues. And throughout that period, I continued my research, which was basically focused on human rights and foreign policy and how to develop a human rights approach to conflict resolution. And increasingly, also, I was working on gender and foreign policy as well. I was in California working in the Department of Peace Study when I received a call from the foreign ministry to tell me that the Chilean president, President Gabriel Boric, has appointed me as permanent representative of Chile in Geneva. 
And yes, after a little less than two years here, it has been a privilege and it's always a joy actually to work here. Uh, for Chileans, it's common to appoint the scholars in uh, diplomatic positions. And it's something that has worked very well because I believe we bring particular skills and a particular way of looking in, into the world. So that's a little bit of my trajectory. And it's a very interesting trajectory. And as it happens uh, more often now in these years, you, you see diplomatic corps integrating skills that before were just not there. And your actually trajectory is quite, you know, indicative of and telling of this new way of bringing professional skills into diplomacy, a field before only a few decades ago, really reserved and fenced uh, off to, you know, for the initiated. And so, yeah, you represent this kind of new way of uh, dealing with uh, foreign policy. Many member states of the UN have that tendency as well. And I, I think it's a very interesting point to mention. But let's now start talking a little bit about uh, Chile. You're the permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations here in Geneva. So, of course, for those who don't know, every member state has a permanent representative, of course, in New York, and then, of course, another one in, in Chile. And these are two different persons. And um, let's take a look at uh, the uh, uh, rich and fascinating, uh, you know, profile and history of Chile. And for those who do not know your country, uh, how would you present Chile and what are the key moments of its history? Let me start by saying that I think that geography defines Chilean character. If you look at Chile in the map, it's quite striking what you see. It's an exceedingly long country with a narrow strip of land. The Chile is 4,300 kilometers long, but it's only 150 kilometers wide. So when we talk about Chile, we only talk about the north and the south, and there is no east and west. So we are kind of uh, stuck between the magnificent and the mountains of the Andes, and on the other hand, the endless Pacific Ocean. This long, long land is unique and packed with breathtaking landscape and nature, as I said, from long to south. We have the world's driest desert in the north, the clearest skies, which today we have many, many observatories and important science going on in the north of Chile. We have also in the south, pristine forests, lakes, volcanoes, Patagonia and Antarctica. So it's, it's a quite diverse country, which is also in terms of nature, but it also has been increasingly also debased uh, plural and uh, in the sense of the, the kind of populations that we have. We are 18 million people. The majority are mestizos, which is, you know, a mix between European ancestors uh, and the indigenous populations. But in the last census, almost 13% of the population declared themselves indigenous as well, which is something that is also a clear part of our identity as well. We are a country of poets, and I always say that Gabriela Mistral received the Nobel Prize for Poetry, and also Pablo Neruda. Both of them were also diplomats, which is uh, also something that we don't, you know, portray to the world quite uh, clearly as well. We are also a country of natural disasters in terms of earthquakes, but I believe that is something that has forged our character and also our values. But we are also a country of human-made disasters in a way. And probably this is where I would like to concentrate when it comes to issues related to the history, which was your question. I think, and probably the more history in the last 50 years, which clearly uh, points out to the breakdown of democracy that Chile suffered the 18th of September of 1973. We actually commemorated this uh, 50 years of uh, the coup d'etat last September precisely because it's a clear breakdown in our history. It was, in a way, a real trauma for our society. In particular, because Chile was characterized up to that date as a country with 46 years of historic and democratic rule. So when the dictatorship happened, that was a real shock for Chilean society, which is a little bit of difference with other Latin American countries, which had a more cycles of, you know, rise and of democracies and uh, authoritarian rule. Well, Chile has a more steady line, democratic line, but the dictatorship broke that. And as I said, it was a trauma and the dictatorship was brutal. What we know today, um, and according to the, the truth commissions that happened in Chile, 
is uh, we have around 30,000 people that suffered out of the dictatorship. 27,000 were tortured, 2,300 executed as well. 200 people suffered exiled and were in unknown through clandestine centers and illegal detentions as well. So the consequences of that, in terms of the violence that the society experienced, had cast it like a long shadow in Chilean history. And I would like to say that even today we're suffering from the, con the consequence of that. It is also, from an international relations point of view, it's also interesting to think that the military regime also broke a long-standing engagement with Chile to the world. It was during the period of the dictatorship, Chile was really an outcast. The United Nations condemned and other international uh, relations organizations and regional forum condemned in several opportunities what was going on in my country. What is interesting also to see that the United Nations established an ad hoc working group in 1975, where at the beginning of the dictatorship, to inquire into the situation of human rights in the country. This ad hoc working group is generally perceived as to be the first special procedure of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. In 1979, this working group was replaced by a special reporter and two experts to study the fate of the disappear. This led to the establishment of the first thematic special procedure in 1918, the World 80, the Working Group on Disappearances to deal with the questions of enforced disappearances throughout the world. Why I'm explaining all of this? Because I think this is uh, pretty much related to how Chile understands its engagement with the international world. The very special procedures that were created at the time are the very same procedures that Chile defends in the Human Rights Council today. It's the reason why we have been at the Human Rights Council four times. And we are members, we're current members of the Human Rights Council started last year until 2025. So it is also the reason why Chile is a clear, um, has been defending also the importance of democracy in different international forums around the world. At the same time, it's important to say that in 1990, Chile recovered democracy through a, a process of transitions, which included several mechanisms of transitional justice. Transitional justice, uh, including truth commissions, domestic trials, reparation to victims, and so on. A process that is still in progress. Even today, we come back in terms of, you know, what else can we do to uh, understand our past and to recover, you know, and to uh, have a better process of reconciliation as well. And once again, we come from that experience and from that experience, we look at issues of conflict situation in the world today. We look at, you know, how can we better respond to situation of crisis and of peace in the world. And we believe that we have a, an extensive experience that we can share with other societies and in other countries. And this is why Chile has been so active in their engagement with the world. So, for example, just to give up, and I will end it with this, this last year we were the president of ILO, basically looking at issues related to labor rights. We are members of the Human Rights Council. We hold the president of ECOSOC as well. In this, uh, because we believe that development is indispensable to democracy and of and we have served in the Security Council historically also five times and we hope to be back in 2029. So that's a little bit of, in terms of explaining our commitment to the world, derives in a way from our historical yeah. struggles. And, and we can see exactly that link from, you know, emerging from this, you know, breaking democracy, as you called it, how difficult it is, how long it takes, but also what are the learnings on the way and how you deploy that to into the world, the way you show up in the world is affected by that, but it's also a sort of a richness. It gives you, there is a sense of motivation transpiring from your words in terms of how you show up in the world. And this is where I would like to take the conversation for the next uh, five or 10 minutes, is you showed us a little bit the history and also the history of this trauma, uh, to use a word, uh, and I have no doubts that for a country, breaking democracy is, is traumatic. So the way, let's look at Chile in the world and in, the, in your region first and then the world now, today, with this baggage, but also looking ahead. So I really wonder what is um, Chile's place in the Americas today um, from a, you know, a political, a strategic point of view as a regional presence there and also what can be said about its relations with your neighbors? 
So the regional space and Latin America and Caribbean is a constant priority of our foreign policy because we assume that we are part of a community that has similar origins and we need to protect that and in order to have a better shared future. Chile has been an active participation in various Latin American, Inter-American, South American, and even lately in Caribbean political integration and coordination forums, which have been built through a historical link between our societies and the desire for a common collective project. Despite our diversity, as you know, the region is quite diverse and with different ways of looking at uh, development and their political goals, we are convinced that regional cooperation is the only way to tackle our common challenges. And we have many common challenges in the region, just to name a few. Of course, the continuing deepening of democracy, the eradication of poverty, which has increased in COVID-19, unfortunately, in the region, the reduction of inequality and, and women's rights and gender equality is quite important throughout the Americas, the increase of citizen security, issues related to human security are a crucial political debate in the region these days. How to move towards a more sustainable development, how to have better infrastructure that communicates among societies and states, um, how to better uh, integrate energy connectivity, how we tackle the digital divide. All of these are critical issues for the Latin American region, and we truly believe that it's better to do that together. It is also important to stress that our experience indicate that if we do think at a regional level and if we really have a political decision to participate as a region, we can do better, actually. And we can influence more also, you know, international debates and discussions related to what are the global public goods that we need to preserve. It is worth, for example, remembering that every time that our countries have acted together, as a region, we have ensured a projection of common interest on different issues. The decisive Latin American contribution to the development, for example, of the law of the sea, the protection of people in the right of asylum, it's critical. Let me give you a couple of, of more current examples. Because of what I've been saying, I have made also an issue of my work as a permanent representative to also work with other Latin American nations within the realm of the institutions in Geneva. In the Human Rights Council, we uh, have been actively, for example, on, and we are well known as the LAC7, which is Latin American and seven countries that have been working on the resolution of sexual orientation of gender identity. This is a resolution that at the core is a resolution of Latin American countries and that ensures a systematic uh, attention by the Human Rights Council to uh, human rights um, violations on grounds of sexual orientation and gender identity. This is a Latin American agenda that is actually recognized throughout all the members of the Council as, you know, quite significant and also building bridges among different regions when it comes to these issues as well. And there is a variety of examples in which we have been working together on different agendas in Geneva as well as a Latin American countries. And when we zoom out a little bit from the region into the world, um, maybe this is a perfect place to just, you know, say in a few words, what is Chile's place in the world of today? What it brings to humanity in a way? <laughs> I think it's a great question and uh, thank you for that. When I was thinking about this question, I think Chile brings humanity back in, in a way. And, and why I said that? Because I think Chile has historically put human dignity at its center of its foreign policy, precisely because of our history that we were commenting at the beginning of this interview. But also, let me tell you that Chilean diplomats, along with a number of also leaders from other developing countries, played a significant role during the drafting of the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenants on Civil and Political Rights and the Covenant on Economic and Social Rights. In particular, we have our permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations, Ambassador Hernán San Cruz, was among of the drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he did a significant work in terms of including economic and social rights as part of, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. He was also significant in terms of also including the right to food uh, in and later developments as well. He also was the founding member of the ECLAC, which is the Economic and Commission of Latin America and, and the Caribbean, which is also based in Santiago. So... Chile has been at the forefront of the building of what we know as the international human rights regime. 
So that's one thing. The second thing that I would like to maybe highlight is Chile has an agenda for peace as well that comes hand in hand with issues related to putting human rights in the agenda. So the early connection with international human rights relates to Chile's traditional commitment with international law and the preference for multilateral institutions as the ideal venue for cooperation and conflict resolution. This is why today we have clearly expressed our concerns in relation to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We have also uh, indicated that it's critical and urgent to uphold international law and international humanitarian law standards in the Palestinian and Israeli conflict. And this is, you know, how we put forward our agenda for peace. And we would like to hear the word peace more often than uh, other words when dealing with international conflicts in the world. And there is two more things that I would like to also bring to the table. One is that Chile has a feminist foreign policy. And when you ask me what is uh, Chile's position in the world today, Chile is a country that is recognized for its work towards the promotion of gender equality. We launched this feminist foreign policy only last year, but Chile has been historically promoting women's rights in the international system and within the UN. So the idea behind is that the international system has embedded gender empowered inequalities and that violence and discrimination holds back our societies to be peaceful and prosperous. So as you know, we have been working very hard in terms of increasing women representation in different international institutions and also to be able to look at international politics with a gender lens as well. We believe that, and our work here in Geneva is very clear that, that in all the organizations that we work on, we should have a gender focus. So if we look today at issues related to refugees at the Office of High Commissioner for Refugees, of course, we need to look at, you know, what is that particular impact that comes to women that are, you know, displaced. And we do that in all the organizations that we participate. Next semester, for example, in the Human Rights Council, Chile will have a resolution that relates to uh, gender discrimination and discrimination against women, which is a very old resolution that we have been sponsored with Mexico and Argentina as well, and would like to continue with that work as well. So this is uh, something that Chile is uh, very well known in terms of the promotion of gender equality. And finally, I would like to say that what Chile brings to the world is Chile is, is that has been recognized as a country that is kind of a facilitating country, a country that built bridges. I think this is also because of our history. It's also because of our experiences with human rights abuses and the democratic breakdown, as I expressed earlier, that help us that without undermining our principles and definitions, we can increase, we can engage with other countries and uh, increase the potential of multilateral agreements as well. In my work as a permanent representative, I've been also looking forward to reach out. I think if you look at um, multilateral organizations today, you see a clear sometimes lack of trust among stakeholders. You see a lack of dialogue, especially in terms of social dialogue, doesn't seem to be very fashionable these days. Well, as a permanent representative of Chile, or because of the history of my country, I believe that this is something that we can bring to the table as well. It's very interesting how many examples um, you use from the multilateral processes and spaces and institutions when you describe the role of Chile in the world. So a lot of that is actually connected to multilateralism and multilateral institutions. So that is a segue for me. I would not take it to ask you, uh, what do the values of multilateralism and international cooperation mean for the Chilean people as a nation? So what I mean is, do you think as a diplomat and professor that there is a, a connection that is very clear to the Chilean population between you know, their values, their nation, and actually this thing that we call multilateralism? I think multilateralism has been historically at the heart of our foreign policy. And every time that, you know, you look at our history, you see that, that there is a clear link between what happens domestically and the kind of values that we pursue internationally. We believe that the stability of a medium to small sized country in the world like Chile can only stem from seeking coordinated action in the international arena. It not only gives us predictability to the system because we have shared norms and values, but it also allows our voices to be heard in an equal manner and we get 
to have be seated in the table. It allows us to identify common challenges and interests and establish alliance to work also around them. I believe that multilateralism is an imperative of our foreign policy. We are convinced that in a multilateral world, a small country like Chile can have a significant impact, a quite big impact for a small country like mine. And it's often the case because multilateralism is actually is populated, uh, in terms of population, is more populated by small and medium countries than by big ones. Of course, that is easy to see for everyone. But sometimes we forget the weight, the relative weight of this population in the entire system that we call multilateralism. And this is uh, the opportunity for me to take the conversation to basically the subject of Chile in the United Nations. You said it before, Chile is a key member of the UN. You've been in the Security Council five times, which is not little. It makes you a heavy weight in terms of presence in the most powerful instance of the United Nations Organization. And of course, you're part of many other organizations, as you said, and you host the Regional Commission of the UN, the ECLAC, in Santiago de Chile. You're also a founding member because you were there right from the beginning, one of those who signed the charter in June uh, 1945. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what assessment um, uh, can we make today of Chile's journey in the UN? Well, Chile had had what we call a multilateral intuition that led us very early on, as you just mentioned, even in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, to be part of regional and international processes. Chile's foreign policy has a long tradition, a history that goes back, I would say, even to our independence as a nation state of engagement with the world. This is why Chile was a founding member of the League of Nations in 1919. Chile was one of the 51 nations to sign the 26 articles in the founding charter of the League of Nations. In its capacity, uh, it helped to draft the bylaws of the Society of Hygiene Organization, which is the forerunner of the World Health Organization that is based also in Geneva as well. Later, as I stated, Chilean diplomats participated actively in the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and also in the creation of a specialized agency. Chile has been since the beginning a founding member of international labor organization. Labor has also been, and the pursuit of labor rights has been also the forefront of our international policies as well. And this very notion of decent work that has been portrayed also by a Chilean who was the head of the international labor organization actually for three periods. And I think this is connected to the fact that we had had many Chileans in Inter key international positions throughout also our history. Let me tell you that a Chilean jurist was among the 15 judges to sit on the first bench of the International Court of Justice as well. And then I can give you several examples, but maybe uh, moving towards a little bit of current times, Michel Bachelet, which is also our former president, who lived here for several years because he was the High Commissioner of Human Rights, but at the same time was the first head of UN Women when UN Women was established as well. You know, as a corollary of why Chile also has been working so much on gender equality as well. So basically this shows a little bit of the historical commitment that Chile has with the United Nations. I truly think that the United Nations, to use a, a phrase, is an in, uh, indispensable institution for the world and for Chile as well. Now coming to your really role as an ambassador, as a diplomat, as a permanent representative. I'd like to ask you, what is your view on these challenges that um, are mounting, both for who we are, the world, humankind, if you wish, but also the multilateral institutions of today? You mentioned our predecessor, the League of Nations. Now we are in the era of the UN since the end of the Second World War. However, the criticism of the organization and how you member states, you know, lead the business of uh, the organization, this criticism is on the rise. And so our audience would be interested also in listening from you, the professional, the permanent representative. How do you view all of this from the point of view of a member state that really had this multilateral intuition that was in it, into it since the very beginning? I think we are in a changing world and we are having problems in understanding really to 
better grasp what's going on in the world because there are so many multiple challenges. And let me just mention a couple so we can envision what are the challenges ahead. One relates to power dynamics, you know, the traditional realist view of power struggles. I think um, power dynamics have become increasingly fragmented as new poles of influence emerged. At the same time, there is a greater competition among major powers and a loss of trust between the global north and the global south. I think that's really undermining the international system. At the same time, there is a series of interlocking threats, cross-boundary sources of instability and insecurity. Of course, here and today, the major concern is the increasing numbers of armed conflicts. We have seen this so clearly today after the conflict in Syria, the conflict in Iraq, the current conflict in Sudan, not to say what we are seeing today and what's going on in the Gaza Strip. So the search in the number of conflict in the past decade has increased tremendously. In 2022, the number of conflict related death reached a 20-year high. This has had catastrophic consequences for people, societies, including mass atrocities and crimes against humanity. Conflict also, which is a topic that is uh, a permanent topic here in Geneva, is a key driver for the more than 108 million people that forcibly displaced worldwide, which is more than the double number just a decade ago. So that's also, you know, uh, these multiple threats that we're, we are facing. There is also, this is more an old problem, which is the problem of rising inequalities within and among nations. So halfway through 2030, the rallying cry of the Sustainable Development Agenda to leave no one behind that I so much here, you know, as a, as a label here in the UN remains clearly aspirational. With only 12% of the Sustainable Development Goals on track and the rest really on jeopardy. There is also climate emergency. There is also the threat to the environment as well. Since I'm also a political scientist, let me say that I also see a decline and a weakness of democratic institutions and the right of populism. That has clearly also undermined multilateralism and in general uh, as well the way we work here in uh, the international uh, realm. Uh, issues related to new technologies and the increasing like, technological device between countries. This is something that we need to tackle as soon as possible. In sum, I think there are many old problems, you know, all problems related to, you know, power struggles, uh, increasing number of conflicts, but also new ones. And what is missing is a way of how can we think a little bit outside the box and how we can work in different ways to solve these problems. And I think as a permanent representative is uh, something that clearly I spend time in the night thinking in terms of, you know, how can we do things in a different way that are, are more efficient and basically to the good of humanity as well. And when faced with these um, problems, old and new, and the way they come together and they interlock in a way, uh, and this we see in several in several areas, including the rise of inequalities, how should a country, in your view, make itself useful in the UN to uphold multilateralism and maintain also collective security? I think first we need to resource, which is one of our Chilean strengths, which is uh, the, that we rely on norms and values. I think we have to go back to the principles that sustain the UN Charter as long as and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the basic principle that relates, for example, to universalism. All human beings are equal uh, in dignity and, uh, and as such, universalism has to remain an important principle of the United Nations. Equality. No, uh, of course, there is equality among nations, but it's also based because we are sovereign states, but we also need to think in how we foster equality within nations. Uh, I think this is a principle that we have to uphold a little bit more dearly and relates to a third principle, which is the principle of solidarity. I think we have tend to forget how important the principle of solidarity and cooperation among na nations is crucial to sustain also multilateralism and the UN system. This principle of solidarity came back actually during COVID-19. Today, we also have an important discussion, just to give an example, in the World Health Organization, which is related to, we would like to have the first pandemic treaty, which Chile has been actually one of the first countries to push for a legally binding uh, instrument uh, in order to protect us from uh, pandemics. 
Well, the principle of solidarity should be behind that treaty as well. And one of the main aspects of the negotiation is how can we include, you know, better equality clauses within, you know, the treaty as well. And this is something that, you know, we need to uh, put forward. So that's probably something that is important when thinking about multilateralism, how we respect international norms and principles. Second, something that I have been uh, thinking since I am also ambassador here is how can we bring comprehensive solutions for complex problems? I think we, as policymakers, we have an insistence sometimes to offer solutions that tend to be rather simple. But solutions are never simple, and this is where my academic bengal comes from. I think the current uh, international situations requires to think in a more multidimensional way. And this is why uh, it's important to continue pursuing this triad of development, human rights, peace and security. And how can, you know, the whole UN system work together to actually make these three uh, dimensions work in tandem and not as uh, in separate ways? And uh, this is something that we need to work on more clearly. Then third, I think, and as I mentioned before, something that in my almost two years here I, I have perceived is that there is a lack of trust among different stakeholders for all the reasons and the challenges that I explained earlier and a lack of social dialogue. I think we need to make sure that the only way to be able to move forward is to first to be able to listen to each other, which it seems that is something that we don't do as often as we should. To be able, to, sometimes whenever possible, even to put in the shoes of others, which is not something easy to do. And from that standpoint, you know, start a social dialogue that can open, you know, ways to move forward. And I think sometimes multilateralism is more close to dialogue than I had expected before coming here. And we need to find ways in which we are able once again to talk to each other, to look at ourselves in the eyes and to try to solve the solutions that are urgently needed today. And finally, let me say that thinking about the United Nations, I think we tend to think about the United Nations only in terms of the member states, with the classical UN. But many authors talk about, you know, the three UNs. There is also the UN of the bureaucrats, which is the UN that have been exposed also here, which has a particular dynamic in terms of bureaucracy. But there is also a third UN, which is the UN uh, also related to civil society organizations, the UN, even private organizations. And I think we need to work more closely with that UN as well. And I think there is a gap in terms of working with civil society, with scholars as well, which they have done an extensive work in terms of understanding, you know, what's going on in the world. But diplomats, we tend not to, you know, have a close relationship with them. I think we also have an important work to do in that realm as well to come to initiate further dialogues and constructive dialogues with that third UN, as some people have called, and better work with civil society organizations as well. Thank you so much for sharing this. I think um, most of what you're saying is very powerful, and it also gives you know a fresher look at how member states and their representatives reach out or don't reach out you know, across the walls, the fences of UN and, and other international organizations. Thank you very much for sharing that with our audience. As we wrap up this episode together with you, Ambassador uh, Fuentes Julio, I wonder if you have a final message to leave with our audience. If there was one thing that you want them to remember, to take away from you, what would that be? I think the Secretary General's um, new agenda for peace recently is very clear, and maybe I would like to end up with that. He said that the choice before us is clear. Unless the benefits of international cooperation become more tangible and equitable, and unless the states can manage their competition and move beyond their current divisions to find pragmatic solutions to global problems, human suffering will worsen. The urgency of all countries to come together to fulfill the promise of the nations united has rarely been greater. I think, and it's my profound belief, that we have to go back and deeply reflect on the fundamental and constitutional documents of the United Nations, the Charter and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that stated pretty clearly that our ideas and actions should be guided by a notion of common humanity based on the dignity and equality of all human beings. 
that should be our goal and as we all know is an urgent one thank you so much i think this uh, this quote will speak volumes to our audience and to many of those who are listening to this podcast simply because they believe the multilateralism is a source of good and it's one of the things that we have to continue to uphold in our world you know despite all the challenges and difficulties so i would like to thank you very much uh, on behalf of library and archives here at UN Geneva for taking the time to participate in this episode and i thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us today thank you